Hello, I'm Greg Crowder. In this video poster, I'd like to raise the question, does music foster inclusiveness and equity in STEM classrooms? The key words in this title are inclusiveness and equity. By inclusiveness, I mean that students have a sense of belonging, and by equity, I mean giving everyone what they need to be successful, as opposed to equality, which is treating everyone the same. And to get us started, I invite you to look at the two images on this slide and ask yourself how these images might or might not represent inclusiveness and equity. For example, when I look at the band, I am struck by the idea of each person contributing to the song via an instrument of their own choosing, and that feels very nice and inclusive to me. There also appears to be some, uh, some age diversity and gender diversity though not necessarily much ethnic diversity. Plus, the woman in green looks like she might be pissed off about something. The sheet music on the right could be seen as equitable in that it shows you the song that's being played. So even if you aren't in that room with the band, you can still learn the song and perhaps play it yourself and enjoy it when convenient for you. At the same time, not everyone knows how to read sheet music, so that's a possible barrier to participation. So as you can see, there's no single correct way to think about inclusiveness and equity. This presentation will focus on relatively self-contained musical activities, such as teachers pausing during a lecture to sing a song with their students, as Sarah Slagle and her fellow math instructors are doing in this video. However, before discussing these kinds of musical interludes, I want to note that sometimes music is not just an interlude. Sometimes it's really interwoven into the rest of the curriculum, and a good prominent example of that is what's usually known as hip-hop education. Now to really learn about hip-hop education, you should consult the experts, some of whom are the past and present voices participants listed here. For now, I'll just note that hip-hop education seems inherently equitable to me because it involves giving traditionally marginalized students the attention and respect that they deserve, and equity for all is an explicitly stated goal of this approach. And one glimpse into how this works in practice is the hip hop cipher, which as I understand it, consists of a circle of people trading rhymes and rip, uh, riffs with each other. This is potentially equitable in a number of respects. The teacher is generally part of this circle, uh, not elevated on a pedestal, and all of the participants are listening to each other building on what the others are uh, doing, giving and taking cues from each other about who should go next and so forth, and generally reinforcing each other's contributions in, in a positive way. So while we await Dr. Ajapong's keynote presentation on hip hop education, back to the main thrust of this presentation. To help us think through the potential inclusiveness of activities like those listed here, there's a, a really helpful framework which I've been studying over the past few weeks. And that framework is a set of five overlapping principles of inclusive teaching that have been put out by the Columbia University Center for Teaching and Learning. And those five principles are as follows. One, establish and support an inclusive course climate. Two, set explicit expectations. Three, promote diversity and inclusion through course content. Four, design all course elements for accessibility. And five, cultivate critical self-reflection. The next five slides will cover each of these principles in a bit more detail. So moving right on to principle one, establish and support an inclusive course climate. By course climate, we mean the intellectual, social, emotional, and physical environments in which our students learn. So it's a very broad definition covering almost all aspects of the learning environment. Um, and the hope of having an inclusive course climate is that no one will be marginalized. All of the students will feel centered or centralized in terms of that course. Now, if we apply this general principle to the context of STEM music, we might ask, uh, do songs of certain genres help students feel more or less welcome in class? And if we're contemplating the idea of, of the class all singing together, does that promote a sense of inclusiveness and esprit de corps, or does that just feel awkward and uncomfortable for everyone? Moving right on to principle two, set explicit expectations. 
this is another pretty broad one. So we, um, we want to give clear assignments, of course, but we also want to provide clear rubrics, uh, timely feedback, and so forth. And if we set explicit expectations, Columbia tells us that that will positively influence uh, what it calls the three levers of student motivation, uh, shown in this picture as goal, belief, and inclusion. So the course goals being valued by students, students believing that they can actually meet those goals, and third, that they feel included, they feel a sense of belonging. In the context of STEM music, we could ask uh, if, you, if you present students with a content-related song, will that song be on the test? If so, which parts of the song are they responsible for? It's good to be explicit about that. And if your students are writing content-related songs, are they going to be given any training on the musical aspects of songwriting? And will they be graded on such things? Principle three, promote diversity and inclusion through course content. So course content, of course, is you know, the equations and that, the definitions, but also the specific examples chosen by the instructor, the metaphors used, and any degree of student choice that they have in kind of shaping the curriculum, which particular case studies are, are used, for example. In terms of STEM music, um, there's a student choice aspect as well. If the students are writing songs, do they get to choose the topic of their song within certain boundaries? Uh, if you are presenting a song or a bunch of songs to, to the students, are the heroes of those songs, perhaps the scientists who discover something, are the heroes always white guys? Um, so pictured here is a song in, in which the hero is indeed a white guy, the German chemist Walter Nernst, who came up with his Nernst equation. Um, so this song is about that. It is a song originally written by a multi-ethnic team and recorded by the Jackson 5, an African-American group. And it's since been appropriated by uh, me, a white guy, to celebrate this other white guy. So is that okay? Well, I hope so. Um, I hope that by knowing something about the originators of the song and giving them credit, uh, that I'm, I'm being appropriately um, sort of appropriately sharing the credit here. But, you know, if, if your song choices have a systematic pattern of celebrating white guys by appropriating African-Americans music, you know, that, that would be something to think about for sure. Principle four, design all course elements for accessibility. Accessibility, including both physical access and cognitive access. So for STEM music examples, one could ask, um, are lyrics being provided so that people who are hard of hearing or people whose native language is not English or people who have trouble spelling can, can access the song and follow the song better? Um, likewise, um, do the songs come with study guides so that cognitively students really know where their attention should be? Um, this particular song pictured here is a rap by John Chase and he has helpfully provided the lyrics on the screen. Finally, principle five, cultivate critical self-reflection. So instructors should be asking themselves questions like, what are my identities? As perhaps exemplified by this identity wheel here. And what are my biases and how do I handle uh, difficult classroom situations? Um, and reflect on these and hopefully in reflecting make sure that your behaviors and your assumptions are not excluding students or marginalizing them. For STEM music, um, how much of my own musical preferences should uh, uh, come into play in terms of music in the classroom? And if my students weren't finding the music helpful, would I know that? So that concludes our overview of Columbia's five principles of inclusive teaching. I hope that was a helpful overview for you. Um, to return to the question of the title, I've tried to argue that music can be used in ways that are inclusive and equitable, but also in ways that are not especially inclusive or equitable. So music, like any other teaching and learning tool, needs to be incorporated thoughtfully. It's not a magical cure-all for marginalized students. And that's my take anyway, but I look forward to hearing from you. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge the Palm Network, which promotes active learning strategies in undergraduate biology and chemistry courses.